Guys, thank you again for being here tonight. It is good to have you here. Uh, good to ha see you enjoying being together. If you start making your way back to your seats, we're going to uh, prepare for the Word of God tonight. So, for those that have been with us, you know that we have uh, we've been making our way through Isaiah chapter nine. Uh, the last few weeks, we have had really, really great messages as. David talked to us about the wonderful counselor, and last week, Joanne, about mighty God. And so then tonight, another one of my favorite preachers, uh, Jonathan, is going to be coming to, uh, to share to us the picture of Jesus as our everlasting Father. So Jonathan, please come and, uh, and share the Word of God as he has shared it with you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys hear me? Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to gather together uh, to celebrate your provision for us, to celebrate the, the coming of your gift. You gave, you gave it all. So Lord, I, I ask that you soften our hearts open our hearts, our, 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 our eyes, our ears, our understanding to receive what we have received Amen. as much as possible. Wherever we're at in our understanding, Lord, I pray that you would deepen it. Whenever we look at the scriptures, whenever we have conversations with each other, the songs that we sing, may we come to a deeper understanding of the revelation of who you are and what you have done so that we may live appropriately from that. Praise things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, first and foremost, um, once again, I have to start a sermon by thanking you guys <laughs> for coming through. Um, uh, most of you guys know Hezekiah uh, needed surgery uh, a few weeks ago, um, and um, many of you guys came together, you came visited, you dropped off food, you prayed, um, everything looks to be going well, uh, thank God. So again, every single time, <laughs> well not every single time, but most of the times I've been up here, I always have to start by thanking you guys for your support, for again being the body and uh, just, just helping us out in, in, in a major, major way. So on behalf of Amber and myself and Hezekiah and Micah, we, we, we appreciate you guys. We go, thank you. Um, so, the Everlasting Father, <sighs> the Everlasting Father, you know, um, most of us are familiar with the fact that in ancient Israel, uh, names had meanings. Um, to know the name of a person was to know the person's character and nature, or at least the whole of what that person's character, future, or circumstances would be. And it's one thing for parents, the mom, the mother, the father, to name uh, their child, their children, good and pleasant names, hoping that that child would live up to the meanings of their name. But it's a whole other thing when God starts naming. When God changed Abram's name from Abram, which meant uh, the fa father is exalted or exalted father, uh, when God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of many, that's not like a parent hoping for a child's future or circumstance uh, to, to be a certain thing. That's not like the parents of Abram's hoping that his future and circumstance would live up to the name that they gave him. When God changed Abram's name to Abraham, that is like God's putting his stamp, his guarantee that this will occur and I will make sure that it does. I will ensure that it does. And so when God through the prophet Isaiah begins to reveal the name of someone who is to come you can imagine the heirs 
and the hearts that perk up of the reader when they're reading this section of, of scripture, Isaiah 9. They're paying special attention to this section of scripture because this is God revealing the name. Especially with the type of description that we have given. And I'll, I'll get to it in a second. And so I, I want to start off by setting the scene. Um, and it may not seem uh, completely connected to a main theme right now at first, but you, you'll see where I'm going uh, very shortly. In Genesis 32, where Jacob's name is changed from Jacob, which means supplanter or he who grasps the heel, to Israel. When Jacob is changed to Israel, which means to strive with God, what I want you to notice is how God can wrestle a man who we understand to be the pre-incarnate son of God, have his name changed to Israel by this man, and after Jacob's name is changed, he asks the pre-incarnate Christ his name. And how does the pre-incarnate Christ reply? He asks, why are you asking my name? That's in Genesis chapter 32, verse 29. As if to say, you know better than that. You wouldn't comprehend it. Elsewhere in scripture, in the book of Judges, chapter 13, 600 years later, give or take, we see a somewhat similar event. We see the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, again, this time appearing before a barren woman who is never named, and her husband, Manoah. The woman is told that she is going to have a son who will begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. That son turns out to be Samson. Manoah and his wife, you guys should read this, I'm just giving a brief summary. Manoah and his wife are engaging with the angel of the Lord, and Manoah asks the angel his name. And the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, says in verses 18, Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful, or in other words, seeing that it is beyond understanding. What I'm trying to get here, get at here, by starting out this way, is that it is a massive, is it, it is a massive privilege that we take for granted just to know his name. Just to know his character. And it is coming to terms with this uh, that, uh, that helps me appreciate Isaiah 9 even more. And I hope, uh, I hope you feel the same way. You know, we often say that God doesn't owe us anything, and that is true. Me, when I hear that statement, I usually go straight to the cross, I go straight to his mercy, I go straight to his presence. But I never really applied that statement to his name. We go straight, we go straight to the plan of redemption. He did it. He didn't owe us redemption. But again, what struck me in preparing for tonight is that he didn't even owe us his name. Just the act of sharing who he is with us in a way that we can understand is, a, is, is, is him willingly lowering himself to our level and yet it pleases him to do so. How often do we think of that? Just knowing his name, his character, who he is, that is a privilege. And so we get to Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I have the privilege of elaborating on the Everlasting Father. Again, in ancient 
Jewish culture names had meaning. So when Isaiah is speaking of the name of the coming Messiah here, and he says that uh, part of his name is he will be eternal father, everlasting father. He is telling us about the characteristics of the Messiah to come in a prophetic, in a prophetic way. It is not saying that Jesus is God the Father, but that he has the characteristics of God. In the case of the everlasting Father, the prophet is saying that the character of the coming Messiah is and will be fatherly towards Israel and towards his people. And he's not saying that this is the case from now on. He's saying that this has always been and will always be. Amen. Everlasting Father. You see, we have a habit when we hear the word eternal or everlasting. We have a habit from going from present day onward and it never ends. No. Everlasting or eternal encompasses all of time and beyond. Right? In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that and he, that is Jesus, is the radiance of his, that is God, his glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. So if Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's nature, it would make sense why everlasting Father would be one of the descriptions of his character. It is because Jesus so precisely represented God the Father as his prophesied name reveals. The characteristics here listed in Isaiah 9 speaks of his eternality. It speaks of his relationship, his intimate closeness with us. Yes, and more specifically for the immediate context uh, of Isaiah with Israel. Notice that these are not characteristics of a far away elite person who is relatively unavailable or relationally unavailable. This Messiah, according to the characteristics here, is intricately involved in every facet of our lives. He's not a derelictic father. We don't get that from the characteristics listed here. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He is fatherly in his treatment of us. Now, here's, here's the thing, right? Because thinking of Jesus in a fatherly manner might seem a bit strange to us. And to be honest, it was a bit strange to me. You know, whenever I, whenever I would thought about it, and that's if I ever thought about it, right? Because Jesus had no kids. So how can he be the everlasting father? And, you know, it's because, uh, like, like David said uh, two weeks ago, um, of Jesus being the, the wonderful uh, counselor, we rarely, if ever, think of Jesus being the everlasting father. Yet that is what the prophet Isaiah wrote. That's, it. That, that's what God inspired him to write. And now we, we, we usually don't think or, or, or talk about it much because we generally don't want to add any confusion concerning the Trinity or the complex unity of the Godhead. And that's understandable. We know that there's God the Father, there's God the Son. They are not the same person, yet they are one. The, the Father sent the Son, the Son obeys and glorifies the Father. Both the Son and the Father sent the Holy Spirit. So, referring to Jesus as the everlasting Father might just add further confusion, so we figure it's best not to mess with that. But again, Isaiah is not saying that Jesus is God the Father. He's saying that the coming Messiah is divine and acts, father, and acts fatherly towards his people forever. And now here's the thing. Just hang with me here. Alright? I'm going to make the argument 
that Jesus makes his fatherly attribute clear when he was with his disciples. He did act fatherly and spoke of his eternal fatherhood, so to speak, in a way that is very easy for us to miss. And how did he do this? I am going to argue that he did this whenever he spoke of himself as being a shepherd. Think about it. Isn't being fatherly and being a shepherd essentially the same thing? Like a father, a shepherd's job, his whole goal is to nurture, guide, provide for, to watch over, and to protect his flock. Just like a father would his children. Just like a good father would his children. Right? How does Jesus describe himself in John 10? And I'm, I'm not going to read the whole section, but I'll, I'll read some key parts here. What does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. In other words, Jesus answered them and said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. All of that is from, from John 10, verses uh, 11 through 29. Do you see the themes of guiding, providing, protecting, Given. And notice the direct linking of being a good shepherd to doing what he sees the Father doing. It's all it's one and the same. Listen to how Jesus spoke of shepherding his disciples during his high priestly prayer in, in John 17, just, just a little piece, verse 12. While I was with them. I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them have been lost, except for, except for the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Notice the theme, the theme again, protecting, providing. Even Psalms 23, perhaps the most well-known psalm is there anything there that describes the Lord as our shepherd that doesn't exactly describe the Lord as fatherly? The Lord, I'll, I'll read it. I know we all, a lot, most of us have it memorized, but I'll read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fare no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Everything that's listed here, our Father does. A good father does. Only a father will, a good father will let you dwell in this house forever. Right? <laughs> but, but do you see what I'm talking about here? There's almost no distinction. This is what our everlasting father does. This is what the good shepherd does. This is what he has always been doing. Again, everlasting Father. We look throughout Scripture, throughout the Torah, for those of us studying the Bible study plan, and we're just talking about 
how we see God fathering slash shepherding the nation of Israel. Creating a nation from a man who couldn't even be a father. Abraham. Reminded Isaac in years later, his uh, son Jacob, of his covenant, of his promise to build a nation that would be a light to the Gentiles. We see this fatherly hand making provisions as he guides Israel into Egypt. And as he calls Israel out of Egypt, we see him molding and instructing his people on his ways, of his holiness, of the things that pleases him, of the things that are abominable to him, and of the fact that it is his desire to dwell with his people. The cloud by day, the fire by night, guiding them in the wilderness, all the instructions of what to do when taking the land that he said they would have. That is what the everlasting father, the good shepherd, was doing. In fact, I'd argue that the whole point of the job of a shepherd can be an analogy of what the everlasting father does. And I think, I think Jesus is making that exact point when he referring himself to him as the good shepherd. And again, remember Jesus also stated that he only does what he sees the Father doing. Right? Again, he is the exact representation of God's nature. So when we see Jesus being a good shepherd, the good shepherd, it's because Jesus sees the Father being the good shepherd. After all, Jesus said in John 12, 45, and this is just one example of him saying this, whoever sees me sees him who sent me. It all comes together. One more example making Jesus eternal, his, his eternal fatherhood to him being a good uh, shepherd. Uh, and, and there's more that I could have digged. I think I would have gotten last, lost in the weeds there. Um, but the parable of the lost sheep, of the lost sheep in Luke chapter 15. And I'm gonna uh, read the first uh, seven verses, it says, the tax collectors, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, that is Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, listen to this, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents that over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Again, the, sh the shepherd here going after the lost sheep is an analogy to what pleases God, what God does. He goes after his lost and rejoices when they are found. And not only that, you can read, read, read Luke 15 when you get a chance to. What, one of the very next parables Jesus tells after telling this parable is that of the good father. Or what we, what is better known as the parable of the prodigal son. The main character is the father in that parable, I don't The father. The father is the one who, you know, receives the loss like a good shepherd would. Does that make sense? Yes. So Jesus Manifesting, the, uh, manifesting being an everlasting father, 
makes for an interesting backdrop to when the Pharisees asked him in John chapter 8, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets who died, who do you make yourself out to be? Now we have the privilege of, of, of hindsight here, but do we realize how absurd that question is? Just like it's absurd when Pilate asks Jesus rhetorically what is truth when he had truth personified standing right in front of him. Jesus said to the Pharisees, remember when Jesus said to the Pharisees, truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Right? And so here we have Jesus plainly saying he is God, that he is eternal, and as if that's not bad enough to the Pharisees, in the same sentence he's claiming to be greater than Abraham. And that's the lesser of, you know, <laughs> of all the offense they're taking right now. Right? And, and, and the significance of that is this. Abraham is the patriarch of the people. He is the physical father of Israel. He's the pinnacle of fatherhood, for the, especially for the religious leaders at the time. And Jesus here is saying, I am greater than the person you consider your father. So you can imagine their reaction, right? We see a, a, a slightly sim similar theme uh, with the woman at the well in John 4. Right? This is right after Jesus talked to her about, about living water. We see her asking Jesus, are you greater than our father Jacob? Again, a patriarch of the nation, a patriarch of Israel. And eventually during the conversation, what does Jesus say? He plainly identifies himself as the Messiah that was to come, that she was expecting. So in other words, he identified himself as a greater father than Jacob. Jacob provided the well that everyone in that community had to come to whenever they got thirsty. While Jesus was offering her the living water, that, was, that truly satisfies. Just in him making that offer, he was proclaiming to be a greater father, so to speak, than the patriarchs. Now we know how that, the woman at the well, uh, we, we know that she received Jesus. She had her life transformed after her encounter with him. She became essentially an evangelist immediately. Um, but we also know that the religious leaders of Israel generally rejected him. They, they took offense to him, for the most part. They thought he was a blasphemer. And how did Jesus react? When the days were drawing near to his crucifixion, let me point out one example of the brokenness of a father-like heart that you hear from Matthew 23, this is Jesus. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing? Those are the words of, you could say those are the words of a broken heart, yeah. right? One scholar noted that some would confine Christ's allusion to his own mission in Judea, right, the incarnation, and the efforts made by him to win disciples, but it surely applies to all the doings and visitations of God towards Israel during the whole course of their history. Which showed us gracious desire, which showed his gracious desire that all be saved, if they had only will with him, as one with the God of the Old Testament. In other words, 
God the Son, the Messiah, the Great Shepherd, who displays the character of the everlasting Father. When he was lamenting here, the lament that I just read, when he wasn't just lamenting Israel's rejection of him during the incarnation, he was lamenting Israel's rejection of him all throughout their history. After all, he was directly involved in all of it. He didn't just join the story of redemption with the incarnation. Amen. Again, he is the everlasting father. He was there in the beginning. He'll be there then. He is the one who was and yes. is and who is to come. Yes. That's everlasting. In 1 Peter, let's take a, a, a bit of a shift, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, uh, 10 through 12 it reads, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Do we realize, I mean we do just, but well, I just want to connect the dots right here. Do we realize Isaiah 9 is one of those prophecies First Peter is talking about? Yeah. Isaiah 9 is one of those prophecies that everyone inquired to, including the angels. And understand this, and uh, you know, we'll start to wind down here. Mary and Joseph had the clearest picture. They understood more than the prophets did. They came to understand more than the prophets did. Remember what the angel told Gabriel, or the angel told Gabriel. <laughs> The angel Gabriel told Mary in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 and 32. Gabriel says to Mary, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Jesus Yeshua. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Back in those days, and, and there's still some of, the, some of that now in, in, in different countries, the king is known as a father. The father of the nation. We have a little bit of that here in this country. Those who, who came together with the, uh, with the Declaration of Independence, what do we call them? The Founding Fathers, right? So they can gather from here, he's going to sit on the throne of his father David. His kingdom will no be, will have no end. Does that, does that, does that, what does that bring to mind? Ever, uh, everlasting Father, yeah! The everlasting Father. So what do you think Joseph and Mary would say to each other when Isaiah 9 would be read out aloud in the synagogue? Knowing that it was speaking about the child they were raising. They knew. Again, this is look how Isaiah 9, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add a, I'm gonna read verse 6 and add verse 7. Look how it mirrors what the angel Gabriel told Mary. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So again, I, I think I, I asked this question last year. The song, Mary, did you know? What is the answer? Yes. Yes, she knew. Okay? She knew. Mary knew. Joseph knew. Everyone else probably did. They probably didn't. There were some confusions. There were a lot of offenses taken. They, a lot of people thought he was black. He was, Jesus was a, black, a blasphemer. All the while, Mary and Joseph was pondering in their heart what they knew to be true. So, the issue and the problem that we may have with thinking of Jesus as the everlasting Father, I don't think they had. They knew. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Yeah. That's saying something. Because of the, angels, of the angel Gabriel's visit, they knew exactly who this prophecy was written about. Can you imagine what it was like for Mary to hear about herself and the son she gave birth to written about in Isaiah 7, verse 14, which says, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We sang about that earlier. Emmanuel, God with us. Can you imagine? There's no mistake that she was a virgin <laughs> when she conceived it. So whenever they read that, she, she, you know she was pondering her heart, yeah, that's me. Wow. <laughs> you know, like Joanne said last week, we, are, we really are too familiar with the story. Probably uh, so familiar that we don't take the time to look into the details and, and treasure the details, because it's much more richer than the summary that we that we that we give. I mean, that's 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 been my experience, even preparing for this. So let's take a moment and think about this. God with us, the, the everlasting Father, becomes an infant. The everlasting Father is the Son that was given. Talk about paradox. The everlasting Father was the Son that was given. The lengths that He went through to give us Himself really knows no bounds. All of this to reconcile His enemies to Himself. What can compare to that? There's nothing out there that can compare to that. I don't care what other God you bring up, I don't care what other religion you bring up, I don't care what idolatry you bring up, I don't care what witchcraft you bring up, I don't care if you're praying to the universe, if you're wearing talismans, whatever it is, there is nothing that compares to this. Every other guy is an idol, like the song says, right? The lens that he went through. As Charles Spurgeon says, let me say that for comfort there is no thought more full of sweetness than that of an eternal God engaged in Christ Jesus to his people to love and bless and save them all. One who has made them the distinguished object of his discriminating regard from all eternity. This is the eternal God. He doesn't owe us any of that. He doesn't owe us his love. He doesn't owe us his blessing. He doesn't owe us redemption. Yet he chooses to do so. In a way that scandalizes. The eternal, the everlasting Father, who doesn't just hold the future, he holds all things. 
So may this be more of a reality for us. I just want to say one more thing before uh, I close up. Um, the everlasting Father, yes, He is our everlasting Father. He acts in a fatherly way towards us. But again, the immediate context of Isaiah 9 was to Israel. So let us not take this verse and just make it about us. It is, it, it is about you, it is about me. But again, the immediate context was for Israel. He is still a father to them. I'm saying this because there is a growing, especially in light of what's happening now in the war, there's a growing movement, a growing war within the church. I'm not even talking about outside. I'm not talking about university presidents. I'm not talking about the media. I'm talking about within the church. There's a growing heresy, I would say, that says that God has replaced Israel. If God has replaced Israel, that he's not an everlasting father. Do you understand that? Yes. So yes, Israel, are, for the most part, they're not worshiping God right now. We gotta pray for them. But he brought them back to the land. I'm saying this again because there's a growing movement within the body, body, that is saying otherwise, and it impugns God's character. If Israel couldn't trust him to be their everlasting father, why would we? But he is their everlasting father, which means he is our everlasting father. So I'm gonna end with how the writer of Hebrews ended in chapter 13, verse 20, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. It's a benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's pray. Again, Lord, again, thank you for allowing us to gather to know you more. And I pray that I pray that we have a deeper understanding. And I pray that our, our, our understanding continue to grow. Our relationship continues to grow. I pray that we have a more ever-growing appreciation for who you are and what you have done and what you will do. Lord, help us. Help us to see, help us to know, help us to hear <coughs> your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jonathan. So good. Thank you very much. So I just I just want to go back to one thing that Jonathan said, and then we'll we'll close. Uh, I did love last year when you said it about Mary. Did you know? So you can bring that back every advent if you'd like. Um, but it's not just a matter of what Mary knew. Mary knew because she pondered. And I think a lot of us struggle with what we know because we don't ponder. Because we run with our anxiety, we run with our worry, we run with the moment, we run with our feeling. And so we can be confident in what Mary knew because the scriptures tell us, and Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And she didn't ponder, what do they mean? She didn't ponder, when will it happen? It says she pondered these things. She pondered what she knew. She pondered what the angel had said. She pondered what the wise men had said. She pondered what Anna had said. She pondered what Simeon had said. So I'll just close with this tonight. What are we pondering? Because so many of us are living from places we don't know 
because we're unwilling to ponder. We're unwilling to sit in the fact that here's what I know, I have an everlasting Father. Here's what I know, I have a mighty God. Here's what I know, I have a wonderful counselor. Here's what I know, I have the, not a, not our, I have the Prince of Peace. And so this week you are going to be tempted to be out of control. Some stuff is not going to work the way that it needed to. Some family's not going to cooperate. Some recipes aren't going to be remembered. Some money is not going to come. Some gifts are going to be late. There is going to be some stuff that we say, like, right now, it's not a big deal, but it will be a big deal when it happens, right? So I want to encourage you, before this week starts, ponder. Ponder what you know. Ponder what we're truly celebrating. Ponder what really matters. So that when little things are out of place, you will remember. There's one thing that never is out of place. I am in his hands, and he cannot be shaken. Let's pray one more time. God, we thank you tonight that you are our everlasting Father. Thank you that you, what you are doing now, you have done before, and you will do again. Thank you that you don't change, and so when everything in us and around us is shaking and changing, we cling to the one that we know is steadfast and immovable. Thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for your name. Thank you for your promises that are not coming. They are all already here. Why? Because everything needed for life and godliness is in Christ Jesus. And so tonight, before we leave, Holy Spirit, Sear upon our hearts this truth. He has given us himself. We have been given everything we will ever need. God, we don't have to ask you to hold us, but I pray that you give us the strength to hold on to what we know, to ponder what is true, to cling to you, because you've already promised to cling to us. Father, thank you tonight for Jonathan. Thank you for Amber. Thank you for the boys. Thank you for your work in their lives and their willingness to let you work through them for us. Bless them. Keep them. Encourage them. Provide for them. Protect them. All those things that a father does, may they see you doing them in their lives. And may we have the opportunity to walk with them together. Sheep of the same pasture. Children of the same father. Thank you for loving us. Teach us more and more how to love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, be sure to thank and bless Jonathan uh, before we leave. God bless you. See you, uh, if not during the week, see you next Saturday night. God bless you.